yeah so before the break we were looking at um the whole idea of how re uh, an attitude of repentance can be lost uh, if we choose to continue deadening our conscience and uh, so it is good to respond to the urging of the holy spirit immediately and you know uh, uh, turn back to the lord uh, because that keeps us sensitive on the other hand if we continue to uh, walk in sin we can deaden our conscience to an extent where it is impossible uh, it says in hebrews 6 or 6 it says it is impossible to be brought back to repentance okay so uh, we looked at the seriousness or and the importance of repentance just to dwell on one more passage that talks about uh, repentance uh, if we were to look at luke chapter 13 uh, verses 1 to 9 um, there we have a, a group of people speaking to jesus uh, about an incident uh, that has happened recently so um, in luke 13 uh, verses or one to five, uh, this is what it says. It says, uh, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, if you look at this incident, uh, we see these people coming to Jesus and giving this bit of news, um, almost as if you know they are uh, gossiping. Uh, they are saying to Jesus, uh, Lord, uh, did you know that there were these Galilean people and uh, they were murdered by Pilate? Um, uh, Pilate took the blood from their, uh, from the from these murdered Galileans. He mixed it, uh, you know, with the sacrifices that he was making to his pagan gods. So these Galilean people must have done something really terrible, something very sinful to deserve a death like this. And uh, so. They probably expected Jesus to say, uh, yeah, you know, those people were really rotten. Uh, and then, you know, it's good that you people are not like that. Uh, but Jesus does not offer any uh, such encouraging words. Rather, this is what Jesus says to them uh, in Luke 13, verse 2. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? You know, he says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. And then he goes on to give another example. He talks about another incident where there was this unfortunate accident uh, where uh, you had the, 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 the tower which fell uh, on 18 persons, you know, killing them. And uh, so uh, over here, yeah, so here Jesus says, again, do you think that this accident happened to these 18 persons because they were more sinful than others? No, he says, you too are guilty. You know, you too, um, uh, you know, need to repent. Otherwise, you also will perish. The point that Jesus makes over here um, is that we cannot look at other people and pass judgment on them and say, oh, uh, they are living more sinful lifestyles. Compared with them, I am good. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, I don't need to... Um, purify myself or cleanse myself in any way. So that would be a wrong assumption for us to make. So Jesus says, each person must look at their own heart, examine themselves and stay alert so that uh, they will not end up in sin. And if they see that the fruit of their life is not really um, in, in line with scripture, then they must repent. Otherwise, they too will perish. So it we cannot comfort ourselves saying that I am better than the others and uh, therefore I don't need to uh, repent. No, every person must look at the fruit of their own life and then determine whether or not uh, they are living in a way that honors God. If they discover that there is something that needs correction, then they must be willing to submit themselves and you know accept correction. 
So in this context, Jesus goes on uh, to give them a parable. And he talks about uh, an owner who has a vineyard and who has planted a, a fig tree you know, in that vineyard. And um, so uh, he says that uh, the owner comes after three years. Um, you know, if, if you could just excuse me for a, for a moment, please. Um, Yeah, very sorry for that interruption. Uh, yes, and so over here, um, you know, Jesus says um, in the parable, the owner comes after three years and he finds that the fig tree has not yet borne any fruit. And who, so he says, you know, let's cut down this tree because it's occupying the space. It's uh, using up the nutrients which are there in the soil and it's not yielding anything. Uh, so, you know, instead we can plant something else over here. And uh, so uh, the owner wishes to cut it down, but the gardener intervenes. And over here, you know, the gardener is um, uh, representing Jesus. Uh, so the gardener says, no, let us give this uh, tree one more chance. So he says, I will again, you know, dig around it. I will, um, you know, take care of it. I will fertilize it. And uh, maybe, you know, if I keep ministering to it, um, maybe there will be growth. And uh, so he says, let's give it one more year. And then even if next year there is still no fruit, you know, then, um, you know, we can cut it down. Uh, and so Jesus offers a word of warning and he also offers a word of hope. Uh, he he points out that uh, if, the, if their actions, if their speech, if thoughts are not in line with what God wants, then they must repent. If they don't repent, then there is a danger that they would be, you know, cut down, that they would perish. He also offers a word of hope. He says, God is still giving you a, one more chance. He is still willing to work with you. He is willing to help you to, you know, uh, change yourself. And so if you are willing, there won't be any need, uh, you know, to cut down the tree. So the Lord is also giving a word of assurance and saying there is still hope. There is still another chance. And uh, so we need to be people who are constantly looking at the fruit in our lives uh, to see whether the fruit that is uh, being born is something that is honorable to the Lord or not. Um, because that shows what is inside. If uh, what is inside the heart is uh, sin, and if what is inside the heart is evil, then uh, the fruit which comes out will be sinful, it will be worldly. Uh, it will be displeasing in the eyes of God. So if we see that kind of fruit coming out of our words, out of our actions, then we need to um, correct ourselves and we need to straighten out the inside, repent and clean up the inside so that good fruit comes out in the future. So Jesus says, rather than looking at other people and then uh, you know, comparing ourselves with them, and thinking that we are doing well, rather than taking on that approach, we should be people who are constantly looking at the fruit coming out of our, our own lives. Because uh, uh, the fruit in our own lives uh, will reveal whether we are um, walking in line with God or not. Uh, so it is important for us to focus on the fruit. Just a moment, please.
yes i'm sorry for the interruptions it's just that i've been having some technical issues uh, and i'm in fact not connected with the google classroom uh, actually for this recording uh, so uh, yeah please you know just bear with me for a for a little bit um so yes so we have seen that um uh, we must examine the fruit coming out of our life and if it is not in line with what god wants then uh, repentance is in order because only then uh, you know if our fruit is god honoring only then can we claim to have an overcoming life because an overcoming life is all about victory it's all about uh, uh, overcoming uh, the values set by the world and living in a way that pleases and honors god so you see um, it's all about uh, following godly principles and um, uh, you know reaching up to standards that are higher than what the world has set so we choose to overcome the world and uh, what it has to offer and what it has to suggest we overcome that and we make a conscious choice to place our faith in the lord and uh, live in the victory that he gives so the overcoming life is centered around this whole concept of faith uh, which is what we see in first john chapter 5 uh, verses 4 to 5 uh, first john 5 4 to 5 this is what it says um, it says uh, um, this is the victory that has overcome the world even our faith and then in verse 5 it says only the one who believes um, you know uh, is the one who who overcomes so uh, we see that uh, the victory that we have is uh, based on our faith now um, you know uh, even as i have just been reflecting on this whole issue of faith and the struggle that we have as christians uh, what i have you know observed is that uh, the Christian struggle, you know, this uh, struggle that we have with faith, um, it lies in three main areas. The first area where we struggle uh, is the area of inner desires and ambitions that are wrong. Uh, you know, we are tempted uh, to do what goes against the will of God. And um, uh, God, you know, urges us in our hearts to follow what he wants uh, rather than just give in to the desires of our heart uh, that is one area of struggle the second area where we tend to struggle is in this uh, whole aspect of you know hard the hardships of life the trials and the difficulties that come our way and uh, in in that case the temptation is um, us feeling that the lord has you know abandoned us that he has not um fulfilled his word in protecting us and blessing us and so there is a chance that uh, we would be tempted to grow bitter against him or we could even maybe get driven into despair you know where we lose hope uh, where we think that uh, the lord is uh, not really going to keep his word uh, so uh, our faith is affected you know in that way a third area of struggle for us believers is this entire um, world system you know where the world uh, says that life is meant to be lived a certain way you know we need to uh, promote ourselves uh, we need to place ourselves on the top because no one else is going to do that for us so we choose to you know chase after wealth and status and power and influence and uh, this is what uh, the world says life is all about and uh, on the other hand we as believers are called to live according to a totally different set of principles where it is all about humbling ourselves and placing other people's interests first uh, where it's all about um, honoring what uh, god values rather than what the world values uh, because god says you know he will meet all our needs uh, but then he doesn't uh, uh, you know encourage us to worship mammon uh, we are um, you know um, told not to uh, uh, make wealth or power our chief priority so um, even as we live in this world 
um, it becomes very difficult when we are following biblical principles uh, because the world will not always reward us uh, for following biblical principles. You know, they will say uh, you are um, um, always putting other people first, so you will never rise up in life. And also we may see that, you know, this is a reality uh, where we don't always become the richest or the most popular or the most famous because we are following uh, principles that are not of this world. And, and so um, when it comes to uh, such situations, our faith is uh, tried. So we would have to hold on to the Lord and say, I know that uh, you know what God wants is best, even though I don't see the rewards here in this world. The world is not uh, you know, favoring me because of the principles that I am following, but I choose to continue to trust in God because when I go to heaven, you know, I will receive my uh, eternal reward. So, in these three areas, our faith gets tested, and the way we overcome and the way we uh, gain victory is by holding on to our faith. Okay, so. Um, So uh, let's look at how faith, you know, operates in these three areas of struggle and how we uh, must overcome. To take the first, uh, you know, the, the first area of attack uh, where uh, our sinful desires, our own ambitions uh, get in the way. So here we would have to assert ourselves, you know, and say, no, what God wants for me is best. So even though, uh, uh, you know, the desires of my heart are, um, you know, uh, asserting themselves, I choose instead to follow what uh, the Lord wants. And so, um, you know, like uh, Joseph, we, we, we choose to, uh, you know, flee from the temptation. Why? Because um, what God values, we recognize as being best for us. So Joseph, you know, had this uh, clear... Uh, knowledge that uh, what God wants for him is best. So even if he goes against Potiphar's wife, even if there are repercussions in the natural, God will ultimately take care of him. He had this deep assurance in his heart. And so he asserted his faith and he chose uh, to do what uh, God wanted. Uh, and so, um, you know, um, when it comes to the desires of our heart, we choose to believe that what God has for us is best. And so we, we suppress those desires. Uh, we choose not to give in to them because we believe that God has something higher and better for us. In the second uh, area of struggle that we know we, we, we talked about, where we are facing hardships and trials, because we choose to believe that God is faithful, that God does provide, that God, uh, you know, uh, wants uh, us to prosper. He wants what is best for us. Uh, and so we, even though we are going through those hardships, we do not grow bitter against the Lord because we trust him. We trust who he is. And uh, at the same time, we also do not give in to despair or go into depression because we know that ultimately the Lord will come through for us. So we assert our faith, you know, in, in that way when it comes to uh, difficulties and trials. Coming to the third area where you have the world pressurizing us to follow its principles and its values, we choose to continue walking in God's ways because we believe that even if we do not receive a reward on this earth, uh, you know, um, when we get to heaven, we will uh, receive honor from God Himself. Uh, we will be glorified at that time in God's presence. Um, we will receive a reward that will make up for all the sacrifices that we had to make you know, down here. So we assert our faith and choose to believe that uh, standing for what God uh, you know, is recommending is best. So um, faith becomes the foundation. The stronger our faith is, the more we will be able to take a stand and say, no, I will not give in to uh, the temptation or not give in to the wrong thoughts that come along, you know, when there is trial and difficulties. I will not give in to the worldly values in the worldly system. 
Why? Because I truly believe, I have faith that what God has in store for me is higher and better. Uh, so that's what Jesus promises us in John 10, 10, right? So in John 10, 10, um, uh, you know, the Lord says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so here Jesus makes the promise that he has come to give his Zoe life to his people. Um, uh, the, you know, like the, that's the Greek word that is used over there in that verse for life, uh, the word Zoe. It's talking about a, a full, um, complete uh, life that is also eternal. Uh, it's the kind of life that God has in him. And that same life which he has in him, he imparts to those who place their faith in him. Um, yeah, so uh, so this Zoe kind of a life uh, is not necessarily what the world regards as life, as being as you know as living it up. Um, in the eyes of the world, um, it's only if you're wealthy enough or if you're famous enough or you know uh, if you're chasing after whatever your heart's desires that they consider is life in all of its fullness on the other hand the god you know uh, the the zoe life that he offers is all um, um god centered it is not people centered and so um the god's definition of life and an abundant life will always differ from the world's definition of what life should be and uh, you know what they regard as being the the uh, the best kind of life so there will always be this contrast between what the world regards as life a good life and what god regards as uh, you know the zoe uh, life which will which has eternal uh, rewards um, now how does this affect us uh, you see when when many people come to the Lord, uh, they come with wrong expectations because they have been taught a very diluted gospel. They have basically been told that if they come to the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, he will offer them um, all the things that life is supposed to be about. You know, he will take away all their problems. He will make them wealthy. He will cause people to favor them and they will be lifted into high positions and everything will go well with them. They come to Jesus uh, because that is the kind of gospel that they have heard, that everything is just going to become wonderful. And um, so when they start their Christian walk and they discover that wrong things have been told to them, and they really discover that Jesus does not operate in this way. It's not just some kind of a Santa Claus, you know, who, who hands out uh, the uh, these goodies which the world regards as the ultimate in life, then their faith is shaken. They have based their faith on something wrong that was told to them. And so their expectation from Jesus is completely different from what God is actually offering. Now, I am not saying that God is not offering us prosperity and shalom and uh, you know the lifting up of our heads and glory and honor and all of that i'm not saying that because the lord definitely has those things in his heart and in fact he can give them in a far better way than the world can ever give but he does it in his own way and he does it in a way which will bring honor to his name and which will uh, benefit people and who which will also you know be a blessing to us personally uh, so God does these things in a different way. But when people come to Jesus, when they come to him with all the wrong expectations, they are having a, they are placing a faith in him, which is not really biblical. It's more a wrong faith, an entirely wrong idea that they come with. And so when that faith is shaken, they are nowhere. They, in fact, go back into the world. They, in fact, ask themselves, if Christian life is going to be this tough, then is it worth it? You know, I thought I'm going to get rich and famous. I thought all my problems will vanish. But this is not what this Jesus seems to be offering. And so because their faith was 
entirely wrong first of all they first of all had wrong expectations you know they fall away from god um on the other hand a true christian is one who understands what jesus is offering you know he understands that he is a sinful person who is destined for hell and there is no way that he can ever stop you know himself from uh, being punished and being judged in hell uh, because he does not have the capacity to live a holy life on his own such a person he comes to jesus christ with deep gratitude because god is now giving him a chance uh, to have all of his sins washed away and he god god is now going to equip him to live a holy and different life so he comes to god with this expectation that he will be able to uh, live in a different way he will now be able to save his soul he will be able to enter into god's presence and there in god's presence he will be richly rewarded for choosing the lord and this person has this deep assurance that while he is on the earth god will take care of everything for him there will be trials there will be difficulties but the lord who is present um he will guide him through all of it so his faith is in this that uh, god will lead him through the trials of life that lord that the lord will help him uh, to overcome and whatever he requires for his life for living whatever he requires for his, for his family god will provide out of the abundance of his you know riches so he will not be uh, deprived in any way but god will do these things in his timing so there will be seasons of trial there would be seasons of persecution so the believer who comes to the lord with this faith with this biblical faith understanding what the bible promises an actual believer when they come to the lord with this realistic faith when trials hit them when the pressure of worldly principles you know are drawing them in the wrong direction when the when the own desires and the ambitions of their heart are pulling them away from the lord at that time because they have a true faith in jesus christ and they have understood what he is offering they will be able to withstand and say no i know what god has for me is better and in his perfect time he will grant me these things so they choose to hold on to the lord you know rather than give in to the temptations of the world so the key to overcoming is by having faith and the right kind of faith uh, you know and having that faith in jesus that he is the one who will give us his zoe life you know which is far superior to whatever the world has to offer so first john 4 um, first john chapter 5 verses 4 to 5 very important because the overcoming life is all going to be about our faith in Jesus Christ and we choose to believe that what he has to offer is best and that he will give it give this to us in his perfect time otherwise it becomes very easy to get led away rather than being overcomers we will be just people who are like the rest of the world and we will no longer be living in victory and this is what happens to the uh, believers in this particular church in revelation chapter 3 verses 15 to 21 okay so uh, in revelation 3 uh, verse 17 when jesus is speaking to these people he says you say i am rich i have acquired wealth and do not need a thing but you do not realize that you are wretched pitiful poor blind and naked i counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and a uh, salve or a, or an ointment to put on your eyes so you can see so here was this church uh, which had um, you know become very rich in earthly terms and so they thought that they were doing well and that god's favor was upon them they did not realize that when it came to spiritual riches they had nothing because uh, they had not repented of so many things they were living so much in the wrong that they had become wretched and pitiful and naked in fact and they did not even realize it you see just because um, 
when it came to wealth and power and influence, they were doing well. They assumed that things must be right with God. And they failed to understand that the fruit of their lives is now so sinful and so fallen that they have become wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind. Um, they are unable to even see that the fruit that they are bearing is nowhere in line with God's will. Uh, and so Jesus comes to them with love. And he says, you know, I don't want you to be in this pitiful state. So I am willing to give you gold, which is refined in the fire, not this temporary wealth of the world, you know, which will go away. But if you come to me, he says, I will give you gold, which is refined with fire, you know, heavenly treasures, which will always, you know, uh, be of value for you. And he says, I will clothe you in, in white clothes. No longer will you uh, be, you know, exposed and shamed in this uh, in in this pitiful, you know, state um, uh, where uh, you're living in sin, uh, and you know where the uh, where all the angels and heavenly beings can see your uh, shameful nakedness. But rather, you will be clothed in white robes of righteousness. So, uh, you know, while they were under the impression, this church was under the impression that they are doing really well. Actually, in the eyes of the principalities and powers uh, of the dark world, in the eyes of uh, Satan, you know, and his minions, they were literally a laughing stock because the you know evil forces would have laughed at them and said, you know, to themselves, these people are thinking that they are so wealthy and so well off, but this is what they look like in the spiritual realm. They look wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And that is why the Lord, you know, reaches out to them in love. And this is what the Lord says in Re Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 onwards. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Uh, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So the Lord is saying the reason that I'm rebuking you and disciplining you is because I have genuine love for you. So he says, you know, be earnest and repent of your wrong ways. In fact, he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Um, now, you know, uh, uh, this imagery is generally used for people who require salvation, uh, but then when we look at the actual uh, you know um, passage where this is written we see that this uh, imagery is being used for believers where god is standing at the door uh, of of the heart of believers and is knocking and is telling them you know i'm trying to warn you i'm trying to correct you are you willing to open the door and allow me to come in and he says that if if you know if if you know if uh, we are willing to allow him to come in, he says I will eat with that person and they with me. You know, if you look in the um, Jewish culture, um, all of their fellowship was centered around food. Uh, you would only invite a person to your home for a meal whom you regard as respectable, whom you consider as your you know equal. So Jesus is saying over here. Even though you are so wretched and pitiful and blind and naked, I'm willing to come and have fellowship with you. I'm willing to have uh, you know a, a close association and bonding with you because I wish to restore you. So are you willing to allow me to come inside and have fellowship with you and receive and are you willing to receive correction from me? Uh, so the Lord says, that those who are willing to be rebuked and disciplined in this manner, those who are willing to open the door and allow him to come in, he says, such people will be the ones who will sit on the throne with me. You know, that's what we see in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 onwards, where he says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So um, it's not people who are living uh, a worldly version of an abundant life who will sit on the throne with the Lord. It is the ones who have actually overcome, the ones who have gained victory 
by choosing to follow what God wants rather than what the world wants. It's those people who ultimately will sit on the throne with him and rule. And therefore, you know, the Lord says in verse 22, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Spirit of God is knocking on our heart and he is saying there are things that need to be corrected in your life. You know, uh, there are areas in which you have become wretched and pitiful and I, I, am, I want to restore you. So will you allow me to come inside? Will you open the door and let me inside so that I can um, cover your shame so that I can once more, you know, restore you so that you can be rich with eternal riches, uh, which will never spoil. You know, so that is the promise that God is making to to his people. And uh, so when we look at John uh, chapter one, verses four to five, this is what it says over there. Uh, it says in John one, four to five, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You know, so um, in Jesus Christ, there is true life. The real Zoe life is in Jesus Christ. And this real life, that life is what he wants to impart to us. And uh, this life, it not only is, is just life, it is also light. And this light has the power to dispel the darkness. So when we choose to um, allow God's Zoe life you know, to prevail in us, um, when we choose to walk according to his uh, standards, <laughs> when we choose to do that, um, his light is able to dispel the darkness. Now, when we look at the people of the world, um, you know, they have to do things for themselves, which is why they are so big on, you know, chasing um, wealth and status and all of that. They are so big on promoting themselves because if they don't fend for themselves, there's nobody else to watch out for them. Uh, and so they have to push themselves forward. On the other hand, when we choose to live in submission to the Lord, we literally have the Zoe life of God in us and the light of his life, you know, that dispels all the darkness. We don't have to, you know, um, push ourselves forward and trample upon people uh, to, to get the things which are required for living. God will provide. God will dispel the darkness and see to it that we receive whatever we require. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. So he will take care of our needs. Um, why? Because um, in him, there is Zoe life. So the same concept is again repeated in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians 4, 10 to 12, this is what it says. Um, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. You know, so Paul is saying we are carrying around in our body the death of Jesus. Why are we doing that? You know, why are we crucifying whatever is displeasing to the Lord? Why are we making sacrifices? Why are we living as a you know, living as a living sacrifice to the Lord on a daily basis, we are doing it so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So you see, they were choosing uh, to go through hardships. They were choosing to uh, make sacrifices for the Lord because by doing that, they were also experiencing his glory. They were experiencing his power. There were miracles happening through them. Lives were being changed through the ministry that they were doing. All of this was possible because they chose to carry around in, inside them the, the, the death of Jesus. They shared in his sufferings. They In the same way he carried his cross, 
they too were carrying their cross. They were putting down everything that is not pleasing to the Lord. And they were living in repentance. And because they were doing that, uh, the life of Jesus was being revealed in their bodies. Um, and then in 2 Corinthians 4, 12, it says, So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Because they were choosing to place the other believers first because they were making sacrifices uh, you know, to, to benefit other people. So in that sense, death was working in them in a way they had to sacrifice so much. But because of their sacrifices, the Zoe life of God was at work in the believers that they were ministering to. So um, when we choose to live this life uh, where we are submitting to the Lord, and we are choosing to honor him rather than you know uh, honor our own desires and ambitions when we are living in this way we see god's power being manifested through us and we also see that uh, the people um, that we interact with you know that we minister to they get blessed because uh, through our sacrificial choices uh, we place their interests before ours, and they are blessed, and their lives get changed. And uh, that is what the Christian life is all about, right? It's supposed to be a life of service, where we choose to imitate our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. In the same way he chose to serve, we also choose to serve. Um, and so uh, when we look at it in this perspective, an overcoming life is not a life where you just simply sit back and you know you just you know relax and um, um, you 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 don't just think about yourself rather an overcoming life is where you think what does god want what will please him what will benefit others and so you literally choose to overcome what the lord you know you you choose to overcome what the world is offering as a good life so you rather than going along with the flow of the world and living the good life which the world is offering you know uh, which is good only temporarily you choose to overcome that you choose to overcome the desire for that and you instead take a stand and say by faith i choose to believe that god has what god is offering is far better and so um, the overcoming life is not an easy life but the rewards are eternal and the rewards are very great. So we choose this overcoming life, not because it is easy, but because it leads to a greater reward. And it leads to the fact that, you know, God will uh, one day be pleased with us. He'll be satisfied with us and he will also honor us. So we, we, we don't go with the easy life that the world has to offer rather we choose the life in jesus which he has you know prescribed for us uh, because that leads to something better so in that context you know maybe we could just look at uh, you know the the stand which the the stand of faith which moses takes why did he choose to live an overcoming life you know and we see that in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and we see that in verses uh, 24 <clears throat> up to verse 27. Hebrews 11, uh, 24 to 27, this is what it says. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God, than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin okay so um he was part of the royal family even though he would probably never have ascended the throne but you know he he had all the privileges and luxuries of royal life open to him but it says here he chose rather to be ill-treated with the people of god than enjoy those pleasures because those pleasures are fleeting they're only there for a little while and then they will be gone. He thought it would be much better to, to be ill-treated along with God's people. Um, why? Because it says over here in verse 26, he considered the abuse suffered for the safe, sake of Christ to be greater wealth 
than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. Okay, so he was looking ahead to a reward that was awaiting him. And it says in verse 27, by faith he left Egypt unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. So he set his eyes on this invisible God who is promising him a great reward, and he held on by faith. He placed his faith in this invisible God whom he could not even see because he understood that the rewards of holding on to this invisible God is very, very great. The reward would be very, very great. Um, so the overcoming life is a life that we choose because even though the world cannot see it, even though the world does not understand us, we are aiming for something that is of eternal value. So while the world looks at us and thinks, why are these people being so um, you know, uh, defeatist is the term that they would use. So they don't understand. We are not allowing ourselves to be defeated. Rather, we are preparing ourselves for a great victory where we will sit on the throne with the Lord and rule and reign with him, because that is the promise that the Lord makes to the people who overcome. It says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. You know, And uh, so we are aiming for something that is at the moment invisible, but we know it is there. And by faith, we are holding on to what you know God has to offer. So um, repentance and the, uh, the repentant lifestyle and the overcoming life, they are you know, closely linked. We choose to walk in repentance on a daily basis, examining ourselves you know, soberly to find out whether or not we are walking in the Lord. We do that because we know that when we overcome by faith one day, the reward that will be uh, given to us will be extremely great. All right, so um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the uh, lessons that you have taught us today through this session. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will be people who are overcomers, that even though uh, you are invisible, even though we do not see the heavenly um, you know, uh, privileges which are there, the riches which are there uh, as yet with our physical eyes, we know by faith that they exist. And so we choose to hold on to you. We choose, just like Moses, we choose to hold on to uh, the invisible one who is the creator, who is sovereign. We choose to hold on to you by faith. And rather than following the way of the world, we choose to walk by biblical principles so that we can have the reward which you have awaiting us. And so, O oh Lord, we pray that even as you knock on the door of our hearts, even as you warn us of things, um, of areas where we need to change, we pray that we will open the door wide, allow you to come in, receive the correction that we need from you so that you can build us up, so that we will be overcomers who can one day sit with you on your throne and rule and reign along with you. So I pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you would help us to live a repentant lifestyle and to become overcomers who are uh, not placing their eyes on the things of the world, but who are looking to that which is invisible, that which is eternal, that which is more solid than the fleeting things of the world. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to get our priorities and perspectives right. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we'll meet again next week.